Ross with you today. We are talking about the Nephilim. This is a Ross. This is a topic that everybody gets excited about. This is a very um, mysterious passage in the Bible, and we're going to be kicking off with Genesis oh, yeah. chapter six, where it yep. all begins, where it's first mentioned, uh, and we're going to be bouncing off into some less known texts, some wild reads, some really exciting stuff, uh, and we're going to be following through the progression of um, uh, of the concept of the Nephilim in the Tanakh and uh, and try and make sense of, of what's going on. G'day to everybody in the comments section. Please leave comments. Uh, we have so much to get through, don't we, Ross? We've got so much to get through today that we want to dive right into it and uh, and get as much done as we can. And then we are going to re we're going to address some of the comments at the end. How's that sound? That sounds wonderful. Yeah, I think you're right. We have a lot to cover. Look, this stuff, like you said, everybody loves this kind of stuff. This is like the National Enquirer reading of the ancient world, is it not? I mean, yes. come on now. This is really good stuff. The Nephilim. All right, so we should jump straight into everybody wait, knows. Wait, 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 wait. I, I want to ask you this. I did I did some research on a couple of things, and you looked at something else. So let's kind of tell them. Yes, we're going to go through the biblical text, but I want to give you just a – I'm not going to tell them exactly because they have to stay to hear it. But I spent my time in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. I spent my time looking at some ancient texts. One of the texts that we're going to look at tonight was found in Cave One, one of the first Dead Sea Scrolls discovered uh, really? in 1946-47. Um, and I found a couple of other Dead Sea Scrolls that we're, that we're going to talk about when we get into the subject of the Neph Nephilim. What did you look at? Tell me, just give me a little bit of it. Okay, so you, now this was what, maybe even almost a month ago that you floated the idea, why don't we just, you know, talk about the Nephilim? This is one of people's favorite topics. It's very mysterious and, um, and, and, and it's always fun. Yep. When you said that, uh, the first thing I thought of was the Book of Enoch. And, uh, wow. and that was something, and I, I got excited because this is a wild read. If people have not read it already, the Book of Enoch, you really need to do yourself a favor and, and go and read it because it is just a spectacular, exciting read. Uh, and so it gave me an excuse to go back there and reread at least the relative passage um, that we have to Genesis chapter 6 and the topic of the Nephilim. I'm excited to, uh, to... I'm going to read some of that. Now, I know that you you talked about the um, uh, passages in the in Dead Sea Scrolls. I have, I have no idea about that. I haven't looked at that, and so I'm really eager to hear what you've uncovered and how it relates. So... Um, this is going to be you enlightening. Ready? You ready to jump in then? Let's do I'm, this. I thing, want to it because there's a lot in this. Now, All right. let, me, let me say one thing, uh, Jonah. When we go to Genesis chapter 6, which is where mm. we begin, I want to actually begin one verse before Genesis 6 Ooh. begins. And, okay. and the, reason, the reason I want to do that is I want to follow the ancient cycle breaks in the Hebrew text. In other words, if you look at an English Bible, these chapters are relatively late innovation. What mm -hmm. I want to do is go to the ancient or the Masoretic uh, beginning of this section. And it, so it's chapter 5, verse 32. You ready? Mm, Here go, we go. go ahead. I'm, you start with that. I'm, I'm going to read the first one. Now, after Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Yafet. Now, it came about when mankind began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, Jono, that mm. the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not remain with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of mankind and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, or as the Hebrew would say, men of the name, men of the name. Now, what is this text talking about, Jonah? That is, uh, and I, and I got to say, even uh, as a kid reading this, I thought this is just, this is a cool passage. What does this mean? Who are these mighty men of old, men of renown, men of yeah. name, men of reputation, men of note? Who are right. these? And, uh, and, and it's even more mysterious when you start to dissect it and analyze it, Ross, because who 
exactly are the Nephilim? Are the Nephilim the 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 men of old, the the uh, mighty men of old, the men of renown? Uh, exactly. Or, or are they the sons of God? Um, and it's not entirely clear which is which. Are the, are the Nephilim the? Uh, well, you tell us. What does Nephil? What does Nephilim mean? Well, let me let me agree with you on that. I'm unclear too. All of if you read the literature, like we're going to talk about tonight, the big question is: Are the Nephilim? Uh, are these mighty men? Are they the descendants, the offspring of this union between this group? Hmm. Yeah, who is it? But now, so this is where I'm going to really focus uh, tonight on the Hebrew word Nephilim. What does it mean? If we look strictly at the Hebrew, the Hebrew word Nephilim is plural mm -hmm. or the, the word Nephal, Nun, Pe, Lamed, and it means literally to fall. Mm. So the ancient view, as you know, is that this word means either the fallen ones or the ones who cause others to fall. But it has something to do with either falling or causing to fall. Both can be supported by the Hebrew text, and we're going to explore that to the nth degree. And when you come to that um, definition, Ross, it's easy to connect, uh, or it seems natural to connect, the sons of God, being the sons of God, with fallen ones that have come and uh, mated, if you like, with the daughters of men. It right. just seems to be the, the connection that follows. Um, perhaps. Uh, but then who are the Nephilim? Are the Nephilim the ones that have fallen, if they are the sons of God? Or are the Nephilim the men of renown uh, and um, mighty men of old? Yeah. Well, I, I tell you, you're, you're right to make that association. First of all, as we have both said, this is a difficult text, and there's really nothing like it in the Hebrew Bible. Mm. It is standalone. I mean, you don't... Okay, so let's say that the interpretation, the view that this has to do with angels who lost their former estate in the heavens, whatever that was, yeah. and they were tempted when they looked at these luscious human women yeah. and they left everything, you know, leave heaven for women. Yeah. Uh, if this is what this text means, uh, then like you said, you, you're connecting who are the sons of God. Really, when we talk about the B'nai Ha'Elohim, mm. we only see this in one other place uh, really clearly, and that's in the book of Job. Oh, true. And, and, That's right. You know, in Job chapter one, verse nine, mm -hmm. Job chapter two, verse one. And in that setting, too, it's sort of an interesting thing because mm -hmm. it, it presents itself. How literally we take this is a question. But it, but God says to these B'nai Elohim, you know, he asks a reckoning. What, what have you been doing? What have you been up to? And of course, the Satan is there as well. Mm -hmm. so this is this is going to be interesting. So what do you think so far? I mean, well, yeah, well, well, we go ahead. Okay, so so we have um, right off the bat we have uh, a problem within the, the text presents a problem. If the Nephilim are the uh, the the heroes of old, men of renown, then what we have is a description of men of renown. They are men. Right. We find out later, and we're going to get there, we're going to go to texts that describe them as giants, very, very large. How large? Who knows? It doesn't exactly say, except for, well, we will get there, obviously, but um, uh, Israelites who scout out the uh, the 12 um, uh, heads of the tribes that scout out the land in Canaan refer to themselves as grasshoppers uh, in right. comparison to uh, the Anakim. We're, we'll get into the detail of that. But we're to understand, nevertheless, that they are men. Now, the problem is, is that if we keep reading in uh, Genesis chapter 6, it says, the Lord was great, and this is from verse 5, Ross, the Lord was great, uh, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on uh, was on earth, how every plan devised by his mind was nothing but evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was saddened. The Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the men, right, right, whom I created, 
uh, men together with beasts, creeping things and birds of the sky, uh, for I regret that I made them. But Noah, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So um, we understand, of course, that Noah and his family were the only, according to the text, were the only survivors yep. of, the, of the flood that was to come. But the idea was, for, except for him and his family, that men, whole, mankind, mankind was to be plotted out, Ross. Yeah, and and just this this is what makes it kind of complicates the question as to whether or not you know what's going on in Genesis five thirty two through six four uh, because really what you're dealing with is this seems to lead to the decision to blot out mankind whatever this is it is so it seemingly is the catalyst that brings about the utter destruction of ultimately the earth. And hmm. all of its inhabitants. So, you know. So, is, so then the question becomes: Did that happen? Is the uh, the Pentateuch consistent with that uh, that particular idea? And it's a it's a question that that Jessica has already highlighted uh, there in the comments, and we we will be getting to that, Jessica. So, before we do, Ross, can we have a all little right. bit of story time? We've we've done we've done Genesis. Okay, so this is where it begins. Okay, all we right. can all progress right. through the Tanakh, but before we do that, I want to illustrate this. This, this pattern of thought, this idea of the Nephilim and, and um, in, in other ancient literature, if we may. Can we do that? Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I am really interested in what you've got uh, because I, I have no idea what you're about to bring to the table. But I already mentioned to the people that um, uh, I love the Book of Enoch. If you haven't read it, you've got to go and read it. But would it be okay if, uh, if I read a chapter? Read a chapter, Jono. This is right. coming to us from, you're, you're reading from the book of Enoch, is that correct? That's, that's what I'm doing. So now All listen, right. everybody get a, get a nice hot cup of coffee or tea or hot chocolate, whatever you like. Put yourself in your comfy chair with your little blankie. And uh, I am going to read Enoch chapter, <laughs> this is First Enoch uh, 106, fragment of the book of Noah. Apparently. Okay, so here it goes. Now, now this is you're going to love this, Ross. This is written in the first person. So this is Enoch writing in the first person where to understand. Now, the book itself, um, most scholars believe it dates from uh, the uh, 300 to 200 BCE, right? Let so me, this... can I, can I, let me, let me share something with uh, the group watching. This, just so you see what you just mentioned, this happens to be uh, what is believed to be a fourth century fragment in Greek of the book of Enoch. Uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, so yeah, this is an ancient document. So I'm excited to hear what you've this got. This is here an ancient Japan. document. And, and when I looked that up, I thought, you know, this is older than I thought it was. So it just kind of made it even cooler. Um, all right. It kicks off like this. You ready? Ready. Uh, ready. This, again, this is supposed to be in the first person of Enoch. Uh, now understand Enoch. Now, you, if we go back if, before we get into here in, in Bereshit, we have the, um, uh, the genealogy. And it goes through there and it mentions Enoch. And instead of saying that Enoch, you know, carved it, it says Enoch was no more for God took him, right? And there's a whole lot of mythology, if you like, just around that verse. What does that mean that God took him? Why does it say it like that? Did he die or did God actually sort of pluck him from the earth and, and whatever? And we have similar uh, theology revolving around um, uh, Elijah. Elijah. That's right. So it's, um, it's interesting. And, uh, and, and so here we go. I'm ready. And here's Enoch talking. He says, uh, and after some days, my son, Methuselah, took a wife for his son, Lamech, and she became pregnant by him and bore him a son. And his body was as white as snow and like yours, Ross, and red as a rose. The hair on his head was white as wool, like your Ross. And his <laughs> demdema, uh, beautiful. And as for his eyes, when he opened them, the whole house glowed like Look. the sun. Hey, what, what? Like me too. My eyes just, <laughs> I bring a glow. The whole house glowed even more exceedingly. And when he rose from the hands of the midwife, get this, he opened his mouth and spoke to the Lord with righteousness. And his father Lamech was afraid of him and fled and went to Methuselah, his father. And, and you would, wouldn't you? I mean, if you just... Absolutely. <laughs> your wife has just given birth to this little white baby and... Um, with hair as, as white as snow, little snow white baby. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and you think of, wow, you're a weird kid. And then all of a sudden he opens his eyes and the whole. Right. Right. 
in the sun. I'm tan. loving this. I'm and loving then, this. And then the kid speaks. The baby starts talking to the midwife. I was talking to the Lord, you know, as the midwife's holding him. I reckon I'd probably flee to my father as well. So he was afraid of him and fled to Methuselah, his father. And he said to him, I have begotten a strange son. <laughs> you reckon? Yeah. Uh, he is not like an ordinary human being, but he looks like, get this, the children of the angels, right? Ah. Uh, the children of the angels of heaven to me, it looks like. His form is different. And he's not like us. His eyes are like the rays of the sun and his face glorious. It does not seem to me that he is of me, but of angels. And I fear that a wondrous phenomenon may take place upon the earth in his days. So I am beseeching you now, begging you, that you may go to our father Enoch, uh, our father, and learn from him the truth for his place, Ross, his dwelling place is among the angels. So this is Lamech talking to Methuselah. Please go and speak to, to uh, I like to think of Methuselah as sort of a Yoda figure. I don't know how old he is at this stage, but, right, <clears throat> you know, he was, what was it, six, 969 yeah. years old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's probably he's, at least in his 900s. Yeah, he's, he's, he's old. He's, he's getting on. And uh, and if I could do a Yoda voice, I would, but I, I can't. So you're just going to have to imagine that, people. So when All Methuselah right. heard the words of his son, he came to us. And now this is, again, this is with uh, Enoch in the first person, apparently. Um, but it refers that he came to us because he's dwelling places with the angels, right? At the ends of the earth, for he had heard that I was there. He cried aloud and I heard his voice and I came to him and I said to him, behold, my son, here I am. Why have you come? Why have you come here? And he said, <laughs> and he answered me and he said, on account of great distress, I have come to you. On yeah. account of a grievous vision, I have come near here. Now my father, hear me for my son Lamech, uh, unto my son Lamech, a son has been born. One whose image and form are not like unto the characteristics of a human being. Then his uh, father Lamech became afraid and fled, and he did not believe that he, the child, was of him, but of the image of the angels in heaven. And behold, I have come to you in order that you may make me know the real truth. All right. Then I, Enoch, answered, saying to him, the Lord will surely make new things upon the earth, and I've already seen this matter in a vision and made it known to you. For in the generation of Jared, my father, uh, they transgressed the word of the Lord, uh, the law of heaven. And behold, they commit sin and transgress the commandment. They have united themselves with women and commit sin together with them. And they have married wives from among them and begotten mm. children by them. There shall be a great destruction upon the earth and there shall be a, a deluge and a great destruction for one year. And this son uh, who has been born unto you shall be left upon the earth and his three sons uh, shall be saved when they. And so it, it basically goes, goes on and gotcha. it says upon the earth, they shall give birth to giants, <laughs> not of the spirit, but of the flesh. Oh, okay. So hang on. Here, here we go. Uh, so they will be saved. Those who are upon uh, the earth are dead and upon the earth, they shall give birth to giants. So now it's trying to attribute the giants to the sons of Noah. Okay. Um, all right. Interesting. Okay. The earth shall be uh, washed clean from all corruption. Uh, and now make it known to your son Lamech that the son who has been born indeed righteous, he is righteous. You call his name Noah for he is the remnant uh, for you. And he and his son shall be saved from the corruption, which is to come uh, and so on and so forth. And that's what we Come to in the book. Hey, Enoch, it is just great stuff. Now, mm. you know what is fascinating, and I don't want to jump right into mine. I want to give you a chance to to maybe hit the high points again. But it is striking mm -hmm. the similarities from the story you just told yeah. to a story that I see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. All right. So, so before you continue, my first question about that is. What do we date this scroll to? What, what, what do most scholars say? Okay, it is dated, the scroll, the story, my, mm. most, most scholars date the story to the second century BCE. How they come up with that is, is really just basically an educated guess. Mm. The scroll itself, 
the, the scroll that I'm going to talk about uh, is dated to roughly uh, what the, the first the late first century BCE until the early first century uh, CE. So it's right around the crossing point uh, that they date the scroll to. Now, but but wait until you hear, hear the story, Jono. It hmm. it is amazing what your story and my story deal with is antediluvian, the antediluvian age, right before the flood, hmm. and and both of these stories have to do with Noah in the womb. Noah in the mm. womb. So this really? is, uh, yeah, this All is right, cool. uh, interesting. Um, I was just going to say that, um, oh, <laughs> train of thought suddenly left me. Okay, um, your, your, your high points, though, uh, Noah is, has just been born. He's a miracle mm. child, and, and uh, Noah's father is concerned that the child is not his, right? Yeah, Lamech is he concerned. He needs a paternity test. Yes. Methuselah goes to Enoch. Now, now what, sorry, what I was about to say is that um, the book of Enoch, some people may be questioning, going, hey, why, why isn't Enoch in our, in our canon? Yeah. Uh, and it's an interesting thing because by some schools of thought, it was a legitimate book. You know, it was a book that was to be taken into consideration. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I do believe that the book of Enoch is quoted in Joel in the New Testament even. Jude, Jude. you mean Jude, Jude. yeah. Is it Jude? Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jude, yeah. yeah, of course, Jude. Um, uh, and is it Jude? That's, it's, it's, it is quoted uh, in the New Testament. And, um, and there are other writings that refer to the book considering it as, you know, a legitimate canonical uh, text, but it didn't make it into, if you like, the official canon, uh, which is why we don't have it today. But it's it's now one one comment on on that point, Jono. Uh, Karen remarked that Enoch is a series of different books, uh, ancient documents, not all of them written at the same time, according to Dead Sea Scroll mm. translator Dr. Yep. Miriam Brandt, and that is the consensus: mm. is that what we have. We have uh, uh, various manuscripts, like the one that I showed on the screen, dating to the fourth century in Greek. Yep. We also have fragments uh, that are probably uh, from the in the Hebrew. They're so fragmentary in the scrolls. I think it's from Cave Seven, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I'm going to read. You let me know when I can jump into my story because I'm oh, I'm jumping I, at the bits here. I want you to jump into it because, uh, and all. I, and my my point is that uh, perhaps what you're about to read is from a school that considered the Book of Enoch to be a, a, a legitimate thing. All right, so what do you got? So, okay, so certainly the story. So here, here we've got Genesis chapter 6 presents a weird tale. Now, most, and we're going to get into this, but in Judaism today, the stand is this, and a lot of Christian groups, they'll say, no, 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 Ross and Jono, it's not the sons of God are not angels that are fallen. They're not these wicked angels who lusted after women and, and, and had babies. And no, no, no. They, these are the good, the, the descendants of Seth mm. who, who breeded or um, had babies with the, the daughters of Cain. That's mm. the standard view. In fact, let me say this. In fact, if you, if you go by, uh, uh, let me, let me look. I had a couple of quotes here. There are a couple of these, Sources that said in Judaism, Shimon Bar Yochai, Rashi, and Nachmanides all say that if you say that Genesis 6 is talking about angels falling from heaven and, and having sex with the daughters of men and making babies, then you're cursed. Yeah. So, but let me tell you this I got a secret for you, Jono. The ancients didn't know that rule. Because no, they, didn't they did rule. not, they did <laughs> not think that this was some little version of the story where the good line of Seth uh, cohabitated with the daughters. None mm. of that. No. I didn't know so that. here's here's what I'm going to look at. In Cave One, winter of forty six forty seven, uh, the Bedouin discovered the first cache of Dead Sea Scrolls. Among them was an Aramaic text. Uh, 22 columns of which survived. Some of it's fragmentary. We don't have the beginning of the document and we don't have all of the document. Uh, but what we do have is quite interesting. And where I'm going to focus my quick storytelling tonight is in columns two through five 
of what is called the Genesis Apocryphon. It is also known as 1Q20. Well, 1Q, if you, if you study the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the number on the beginning is the cave. Q mm -hmm. stands for Qumran. So it's, it's a cave one at Qumran, and the manuscript number is 20. It's also known as uh, 1Q uh, app, A-P, Gen, G-E-N. Now, you can, by the way, I highly recommend, and there this book on the Dead Sea Scrolls is in the link in the description. I highly mm -hmm. recommend. I wrote a review on my website. Okay, so here we go. This is the, yeah, get comfortable. Take a sip. By the way, I like that coffee cup. What is that? Okay. That's nice. No, yeah. No, no. Okay, here we go. 1Q20. Behold, now you, you just told us a story. I want you to think, who could this be telling the story? I thought within my heart that conception was due to the watchers and the holy ones and to the giants. And my heart was troubled within me because of this child, Jono. Then I, Lamech. I was going to say See? yeah. So here mm -hmm. we go. So Lamech is here. He's concerned. He doesn't mm. think the baby. Now, look, his wife is pregnant. She hadn't had this baby with the beautiful white hair like me and the glowing eyes. At this point, she's got a, a belly. He walks in the kitchen. He sees her doing dishes. He looks at her and he gets troubled. And, and so it says, then I, Lamech, approached Bat Enosh, my wife. Now, remember that name. I'm going to come back to that. Right. Approached Bat Enosh, my wife, in haste and said to her, by the Most High, the Great Lord, the King of all the worlds and ruler of the sons of heaven, until you tell me all things truthfully. If, tell me this truthfully, not falsely. By the King of all the worlds, until you tell me truthfully and not falsely. falsely. So he's, he's really kind of hammering her. He wants to know, what's he want to know? He wants to know if the baby's his. I'm almost finished. Here we go. Then Bat Enosh, my wife, spoke to me with much heat, all right, and mm -hmm. said, oh, my brother, my Lord, remember my pleasure. The lying, I know, by the way, this is PG-13, folks. The lying <laughs> together and my soul within its body, I tell you all things truthfully. My heart was then greatly troubled within me. So even though she tries to reassure him, he's still troubled. And when Bat Enosh, my wife, saw that my countenance had changed, she mastered her anger and spoke to me, saying, My Lord, my brother, remember my pleasure. I swear to you by the Holy Great One, the King of Heavens, that this seed is yours and that this conception is from you. The fruit was planted by you and by no stranger or watcher or son of heaven. Why is your countenance thus changed and dismayed? And why is your spirit distressed? I'm telling you the truth. And then it goes on. Now, now listen. So Lamech doesn't believe her. I he mean, doesn't he wants believe to believe her. No, he doesn't um, believe her. Reason to be suspicious. We don't know what that reason is, do we? It doesn't stipulate what the... the no, but the I have a clue. I have a clue. I'm going to tell you in a minute. So yeah. he, guess what he does in, in 1Q20? Just what he did in Enoch. He goes to his father... He mm -hmm. says, I, Lamech, run to Methuselah, my father, and I yep. told him everything, and I asked him to go to Enoch, his father, because he'll surely learn all things from him. Now, why do they have confidence that the ancients have confidence that Enoch knows all things? Because he hangs out with angels. He hangs out with angels because he, he didn't die. The Lord took him. The Lord took That's him right. and said, hey, we're with the angels. We like you. You're, you're fun. And, and he lives on a misty mountaintop you know, yeah, to quote well, well. Led Zeppelin. So he's yeah. going, he's, he's going to find, he's going to find the truth. He doesn't believe her. Okay. Right. Now here's the thing. The, the, in the ancient world, in two of these texts, the idea that both of these present is that the idea is that, uh, Lamech thinks that Bati Nosh is pregnant by an angel or a watcher. Now, mm -hmm. And, uh, by the way, I looked up in the Hebrew. Let me pull this up. Uh, let me show you one thing. And I'm going to talk about the name Bat Enosh. But look at this. So mm -hmm. here we've got, uh, I have the Dead Sea Scrolls in Hebrew yeah. on, on my iPad. And this highlighted blue area is the word Nephilim. 
Well, it's Nephilim here, but it's Aramaic. Oh, so oh, that's right. a good a good eye. You caught that. Yeah, Nephilim in Hebrew, but in Aramaic, it's going to be Nephilim is, is the okay. ending there. Okay. So I did a search and I wanted to know where else Nephilim in any form appeared in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've never done this. I'm not a Dead Sea Scroll person, an expert, but mm. man, it's exciting. So, he, but let me tell you about the name. Bat Enosh, the, the mother of Noah, her name means, get this, What's daughter of a mortal. Oh, really? So, so what it's saying, at least in the story, right, yeah, okay. At least in the story, the idea is that that uh, there is at the time in the days of Noah, there's some monkey business going around, or I guess we could call it angel business. And okay. the angels are finding beautiful women and they're taking them. So mm -hmm. Noah, you know, he evidently has slept with his wife, but at the same time, he's been seeing some angels, you know, around town and he's, yeah, he's a little bit, you know, maybe he was at work. He's concerned. This is like a Jerry Springer show. It really is. Uh, um, he's he's worried about this. All right. Yeah, he's worried. So so one other thing. Now, yeah. so we've got the Genesis Apocryphon. We we have a couple of other Dead Sea Scrolls. Four uh, Q five thirty through five thirty three. These are fragmentary texts. They deal with. Um, they deal with giants. They deal with uh, fallen angels. There's, a, there's quite a bit of this in the ancient world, particularly in the Qumran text. Mm. But one thing I'd never had read this scroll until tonight, actually. And I want to read. It's just a few lines. And it's called. <clears throat> let me. It's a uh, 4Q180. I hope people are writing these down because you can get all the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're out. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, these, the titles of these scrolls are often provided by the translator. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have a title at the top. But this fragmentary is titled by, J you know, uh, John Marco Allegro is one of mm. my favorite scholars. Mm. I like him. He's a maverick. Uh, mm. Plus, he believed in the Shapira scroll. Here we go. This is an interpretation. This, I'm reading the scroll. Concerning the ages made by God, Jono all the ages for the accomplishment of all the events, past and future, before ever he created them, he determined the works age by age. And it was engraved on heavenly tablets, the ages of their domination. This is the order of the creation of man from Noah to Abraham. So this is the period I'm about to read from Noah to Abraham. Hmm. Until he begot Isaac, 10 weeks of years. Now the, they're in a, these calendars, uh, the Qumran community really is into the calendar. Mm. Here we go. And the interpretation concerns Azazel and the angels who came to the daughters of men. They bore to them giants. And concerning wow. Azazel and what? iniquity and to cause them all to inherit wickedness, judgment, and judgment of the congregation. Well, that, that's fascinating, okay, because we're coming up to Yom Kippur, are we not? That's right, that's ah. right. All right, so, so just unpack that for people if they haven't made the connection. Okay, so uh, Azazel is hmm. uh, the name, uh, or some might pronounce it uh, Azazel, but it is found in Leviticus 16, very bizarre uh, ritual where you hmm. have two identical goats, and you cast lots over these two goats. And one of the goats is to be sacrificed uh, for the cleansing of the tabernacle, basically. The, the other tabernacle. goat, the other, it, by the way, it's not for the sins of the people, really, as much as it is the cleansing of the holy place. Then mm. you take all the sins of the people, Jono, and you put it on the other poor goat's head. And, yeah. and you lead it off into the wilderness to Azazel. So yes. what is Azazel? Is it a demon? Is it, you know, that's what people think. But by the way, in the in the second temple period, this poor goat, you know, he's thirsty. You take him to the desert and you drop him off. This is cruelty. But the goat mm -hmm. would come back. And there was this ritual. They would tie a ribbon, tie a red ribbon around the goat's <laughs> horn. And it was supposed, if, if it turned white, that meant mm -hmm. the sins were forgiven. This is in the Talmud. Well, the goat, 
let's say it doesn't turn white and it mm -hmm. didn't 40 years before the destruction of the second temple, the, the red ribbon quit turning white. And so that's a bad sign. So the poor goat is thirsty. You drop him off in the desert. He comes back into town and kids, mom and daddies are like, oh my God, the goat horn's still red. So guess what they started doing to Azazel? He's brought all our sins back. He's all oh, good. So they throw, they throw the goat this off the cliff. Goat. We don't want it back. This is the funniest no. thing because a lot of people know that I've, I had goats, right? And, and it says in the text of, of Leviticus, it says it will be led off into the wilderness by a suitable man. And you need a suitable man because a, a, a goat is a, is a, it's a herd animal, right? It doesn't yeah. like to leave the, the herd. And if it does, it starts to panic. So you really yeah. kind of almost have to carry it away. <laughs> well, it, it, right? And in, isn't that something? I mean, like, I, I can't get over the fact that you're so hung up in your religion that if you think that God didn't forgive your sins because the the goat horn is still red, and, and you want to, you don't want people to see that they literally threw it off a cliff. We can take people on the Tanakh tour, and I can show them this is where they cast the the poor Azazel goat off. So, what is the Azazel? Is it a demon? Notice in this particular text in four Q four eighty, it does seem to be uh, that that we associate. This uh, this idea of Azazel with the angel that uh, kind of led the rebellion uh, to to impregnate these uh, good beautiful women in Noah's day. Can I can I because I've forgotten is it Azael is is it L as a uh, a syllable designating? Um, a, I think a it's actually I think it's actually Zel Azazel I think okay. yeah Azaz yeah Azazel. Oh, good out uh, of Myth Vision. Myth Vision dropped in. Good out, mate. Um, hey, good deal. Yeah. Hey, so so no, I was just going to say because the goat. That's right. You've got to lead it off by a suitable man, and it is in uh, Talmudic tradition that because um, if you take a, a, a herd animal out into the desert, Ross, and you go okay, yeah. well, off you go by yourself, and it's there by itself, it's going to go. No, no, no. I need to be with someone. I need to be with something. It's going to follow you back because you're the something, uh, even if it's from a distance. So what do they do in in Talmudic literature? The suitable man is supposed to throw this thing off a cliff. Oh man, this is sick! <laughs> yeah, oh, it, this poor it's all... goat. Hey, my yeah, word. It's, it, yeah, it's really sad. By the way, I did check in the Hebrew. It's uh, Azazel. Zel is the the uh, const the. Okay. Uh, uh, all right, yeah, so that's, that's a whole other yeah. discussion. When we when we talk about uh, Yom Kippur, we'll do that. But um, but that's really interesting that it appears there. Okay, let's continue. Okay, now I'm I'm going to set you up. I'm going to volley this to you in a minute because you're going to take us to a spy story. Because oh, a spy right. story, but mm -hmm. but before you go there, there's somehow they go from you you go. How do you go from not nephilim, which means nephal means to fall? How do yeah. you go from the fallen ones? Might be fallen angels, even it seems the ancients believe that. How do you go from that to translating that as giants? And by the right. way, that is what happens in a lot of the text. They translate this as giants. Yes. Uh, and, and I'll tell you how that happens. And then we're going to jump into because it's a perfect segue into Numbers 13. Beautiful. But, this is exactly where we're going. And you're right, because what happens is, uh, as we already pointed out in, in Genesis chapter six, it's ambiguous. You're not too sure. Which description applies to whom? But the, um, the 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 Tanakh answers that for us as we continue. Uh, it yeah. takes a side, if you like. And uh, as you just mentioned, we're going to Numbers chapter thirteen. All right. Now, on your remember, hmm? go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was I just, just going to say, everyone should remember in the back of your mind that um, oh, no stick of performance there as well. There you go. Um, hey, the, thanks for um, that. Thanks for that super chat there. No hey, there you go. All right. Uh, so what, what we're doing is that, um, re remember in Genesis chapter 6, it refers to men of renown, heroes of old and men of renown. So whoever these are, they're referred to as men. Here we are in Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, if I remember correctly. That's right. Now, now let me let me throw one, one key piece in on your way there. By Go the on. way, Gnostic informant says, Azazel, thank you for properly invoking him. Just kidding. You remember the story? <laughs> you, you, you know the movie uh, where uh, the the 
what's the it's uh denzel washington and yeah. he sings time is on my side and it's about a demon possession anyway you gotta watch that movie so the <laughs> septuagint well, before we continue actually i want to bring this up because when you read books like like what what you okay fragments like you just read and the book of enoch like we when we did the uh, the series with uh, James, right, James Haber on, yeah. on his yep. um, uh, book of Genesis, right? Right. And we got to this passage and we talked about, I, I believe we talked about the movie with um, uh, Russell Crowe, Noah, right? Did you did you watch that? It's got Aronofsky's uh, film. Yes, I watched it. Yeah. What did you think? I, You know, I, I liked it. And I know a lot of people didn't. And they're like, well, you know, it's not biblical. There was so much in that movie. Yeah. That is subtle, but it's yet it's it's drawing on some of this other stuff. Like people go, well, what about the watchers that were like concrete monsters? And oh, there's the some crazy monster. stuff, but it was still it was I love the movie. I did. I really liked it. I I think that I finally gave in and tuned into it when I was on a flight and I thought, OK, I've got some time to kill. Here it is. I'm going to watch it. And I think, you know what, to be honest, I think I couldn't. I couldn't get into it. It was yeah, annoying. Yeah, but, no, but wait, Jono, at the time, yeah. though, you were probably some fundamentalist, raving fundamentalist <laughs> at the time. I probably, you might be right about that. But you know what? What I can't understand is this material, like Enoch and all that sort of stuff. Why do we not have anything, uh, a, a movie depicting this? If anybody knows of a movie that um, that, that covers this story, put it in the comments because uh, – I'd love to watch that movie. That's hey, I mean, this well, before you before remember, we have Seth, the right. talented Seth Nichols. He can there make this go. movie. By the way, right. uh, it, it's at Rico. I think I, I'm trying to read it from here. Rico says Denzel's movie. Guess what it's called? Fallen. Oh, really? It's called Fallen. Yeah, yeah it's it's uh, it, Denzel Washington. I don't know if I uh, he's a police officer. Yeah. Oh, I like All him. Right. All right. So Any now you, you wait a minute. I, I have to tell you the Septuagint in the Greek. Uh, in the Greek, when whenever the the translators of Septuagint encountered the word Nephilim in Genesis mm. six four, yeah. they translated it with the Greek word uh, gigantes, which is you know it's sort of a gigantic word. So, uh, and I think I'm pronouncing that it's Greek to me. I'm a Hebrew guy, uh, but but this idea of giant comes in there. But I'm going to show you later that that's a mistake. And but anyway, so Greek mythology, by the way, these uh, the the ones in Greek mythology referred to as gigantes, they're often great in strength and aggression, but yeah. not necessarily. Uh, they're not necessarily giants. Like you're a big, big guy. You're like six four, six five. Yeah, and, let me and just you, say something, Ross. You're like grasshoppers in my eyes. That's right. That's right. I'm a perfect size human. All right, go ahead. Hit me with numbers thirteen. A perfect size human is four point four foot three. Then sure, that that's it. And um, and I'm six foot five. And and uh, there it is. This is numbers chapter thirteen. Maybe maybe I descend from the uh, Nephilim, Ross. Have you ever considered that? Hmm? Hmm? You could be. You could be. We're about to yep. find out. Uh, this is numbers chapter thirteen, verse thirty three. And this is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, this is, you know, when they go and scout out the land, before they go and take Canaan, uh, they send a head of each tribe, uh, including Joshua and Caleb, off they go. Uh, and upon return, uh, they're saying, oh, we can't possibly do this. My goodness. We saw the Nephilim there. Okay, it says. And then it says the Anakites are part of the Nephilim. A little bit of um, commentary in this part. Uh, yep. And we look like grasshoppers to ourselves, and so we must have looked to them. So, in yep. comparison to this, uh, to the Nephilim, uh, the apparently the Anakites are part of the Nephilim. Um, in comparison, they were as grasshoppers, just as you are to me, Ross. That's right. But I tell you what, though, it comes in handy. My perfect size, human size, comes in handy on international flights and walking through that tunnel. At Salom, and you know it, so just knock it off. So, so here's the deal, though. Now, I want you to notice, and uh, Myth Vision, uh, Derek just mentioned that Ronald Hindle uh, wrote an article. He's a Ronald Hindle is a great scholar, a uh, Hebrew Bible scholar, and he does say that these uh, a lot of times people associate these watchers, uh, they're considering uh, particularly Transjordan where we see these megaliths 
You remember mm -hmm. the like the stone? They look like uh, they're two oh, side yeah, yeah. walls covered. Okay, so mm -hmm. the ancient in the ancient world, according to um, Hindle and others, mm -hmm. and by the way, there are thousands, tens of thousands. I think there are thirty thousand megalith structures in Europe alone. Mm -hmm. So the ancient world. You know, when you see that, it's like who built the pyramids? I mean, it causes people to question: Did giants make these? You know, it's, of course, we all know that the Nephilim made the pyramids, and we're we're going to go there. We're going to be there really soon, the thirty uh, first of October on the Tanakh tour. Right. We're going to check out uh -huh. all of his uh, Nephilim uh, architecture, and um, yep. we're moving on from there to uh, to Jordan, going through there, checking out all the Nephilim uh, architecture there in Petra, and then we're going to. Uh, Israel standing on the on, on the twelfth of November, and there, Ross, uh, yeah. we're going to go to the hotel, obviously. And within the hotel, within the um, uh, the retainer wall, if you like, of the temple um, uh, mounts, sure, there are significantly huge blocks. Oh that, yeah, that to this day they do not know how they were placed. Uh, we're going to take a couple of. We're going to look at some of those, and uh, while we're there. We all know that you know the Nephilim put them there, Ross. They had to. They had to. Do you know? Do you know? By the way, do you know that those stones are so big mm -hmm. that even today the cranes that we mm -hmm. have yeah. can't lift a stone that big. Yeah, and they'll and show you this little video. And when we go to Israel, we'll show them the video, and they show little cartoon characters, and they've got ropes hooked up and. You know, you see a guy and he's trying to encourage an ox to pull this, and you're like, yeah. it, it, "It's not happening, buddy. It didn't happen that way." This so is anyway. huge. Anyway, we'll go into detail when we are there. Um, Anakim, Anakim. Let's Anakim, touch that for So, a what we have here, what we have here in, in um, uh, Numbers chapter thirteen, verse thirty-three, is an it, it equates the Nephilim with the Anakim. Okay, now. I want you to go to, Ross, I'm just going to look this up. And while we do this, I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Have you got it? I, I'm right. there. I am rolling You're there. Already. Two, yeah, you two, would 10 be. and 11. Uh, read that one for me, because what we're about to find out is that the Anakim are equated also with the Raphaim and the Amim. Have a go. I'm read ready. that one. You ready? Go. Uh, the Amim lived there previously. A people as great, numerous, and tall, Jono, as the Anakim. Like mm -hmm. the Anakim, they too are regarded as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them Emim. All right, so what we are to understand then, Ross, is that the Nephilim are also the Anakim. The Anakim are part of the Nephilim. The Anakim and the Emim are regarded as Rephaim, and the Rephaim you know, uh, therefore must be uh, a, a greater umbrella or category of the Nephilim. Now, the next thing we do is we go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 21. You got it there? All right, 2, verse 21, I'm ready. Uh, a people, let me back up to 20. It's also regarded as the land of the Rephaim because the Rephaim previously lived in it, but the Ammonites call them Zamzumim, a people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. Mm -hmm. Is that what now, you wanted? That's what I want, but uh, go, what's the next verse say? Uh, just as he did for the sons of Esau who live in Seir, when he destroyed mm -hmm. the Horites from before them, they dispossessed them, settled in their place, and there they remain even to this day. Okay, no, that's all right. That's good. So what we have is the Zamzumim, or as, as the Moses Scroll puts it, the Adzamzumim. Uh, yep. has an I at the front of that word or, or that name. Uh, it may, in fact, be two words. Who knows? We're uh, going to look at that at another time. Uh, the Zamzumim are equated with the Amim, the Rephaim, the Anakim. All of these categories fall under Nephilim. Um, then, Ross... It talks about uh, Og. Where, where do we have the description of Og? Uh, chapter 2, I believe it's going to be verse 8, where it talks about his bed. Uh, let's be, see. It's, it's going to be somewhere in there. Uh, that is the frame for his bed uh, that is um, significantly huge. It's like a it's like a tourist destination. You yeah. know what? 
In the, remember last time we were in Israel and we went and had a look at Og's, Og's finger, which was an unfinished um, uh, pillar, a uh, right. huge pillar that was being carved out. And as they carved it out, they realized there was a flaw in the stone and there was actually a crack and therefore it was, you know, not going to be uh, suitable. And so it was just left there and it's now regarded as, uh, or, or, you know, um, uh, designated as Og's finger. Um, yeah. And it's a tourist so I, destination. <clears throat> yeah, i tell you, the strange thing about uh, Og is that ultimately, so the later Bible translators and interpreters, the rabbis and the sages, they began to, to question, hey, wait a minute. If the Anakim are associated with the Rephaim and they're both associated with these Nephilim, and I thought the Nephilim were destroyed, how in the world do we have these other people? And, mm -hmm. and what begins to happen is people begin to come up with solutions for that. And uh, mm -hmm. so in rabbinic Judaism, and Aronofsky picks up on this in his film, which I thought was kind of fun, is he has Og like hanging on to the boat, the ark, right. you know, because you can't have him destroyed by the flood because, you know, after the flood, they show up again, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So this is the thing. Uh, thanks, so thanks, th thanks, by the way, Chuck. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Uh, so go ahead. In, in regards to uh, to Og, and I'm just trying to find the... Oh, here we go. Okay. Made our way up the road to Bashan and King Og uh, of Bashan. But this is chapter three. With all these men and so on and so forth. Uh, but it talks about uh, Og being a remnant of the... Um, so obviously uh, the Rephaim were destroyed from these particular locales. Uh, but Og, being further up in Bashan, and this is the Golan Heights, uh, as we understand it today, is a remnant of the um, uh, the Rephaim, and so he survived up until that point, uh, and then was no more, and Israel sorted him out. But, um, yeah, that's, here we go, verse 11 in uh, chapter 3. Only King Og of Bashan was left of the remaining Rephaim. His bedstead, an iron bedstead, is now in... Rabbah of the oh, Ammonites, yeah. nine right. cubits long and four cubits wide by the standard cubit. Now, it's it's talking, <laughs> when is the now, Ross? This is uh, anachronistic, right? Well, uh, not, only, not only that, not only that, this is one of those texts which makes you realize that a later writer and not Moses wrote this. Mm, mm. Very, very clear. You're in yeah. uh, Deuteronomy chapter three. What verse? Um, uh, verse 11 and it's saying you know you know like oh he was he was a giant he was uh, a remnant of the riff i mean we all know this because he's you know everyone's got that postcard on their fridge of, of yeah that's Oxford. right it's like uh yeah. you know the giant pineapple or the big merino like we have here in australia and everyone has that photo with this taken in the background and um uh and so this is what that was and so now my point with all of this uh ross is if we go back to genesis chapter 6 Okay. And it, and, uh, and it says, you know, God says, uh, my whole deal here with the, the, the flood is to wipe man from the face of the earth, save Noah and his sons. Yeah. Uh, and uh, why? It's, it seems like, well, one of the major reasons is because the sons of God made it with the daughters of men and produced uh, Nephilim, you know, the giants. And, uh, and he wanted to eradicate that as well as the wickedness of, of uh, every inclination of man's heart. Um it, it, when we read these texts, it's, it seems like God was not successful in, in his ad, in, endeavor, and it was all for nothing uh, up until at least this point. Yeah. So that's problematic. What do you make of it? It, 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 it is problematic. And, you know, there are a lot of uh, things that we could ask, like if, if these sons of God are, in fact, angelic or fallen angels uh, and they impregnated women and they produce giants and all that, mm. is that really, does that shed, uh, does that point out some wickedness or depravity on man's sake? Or is it, you know, why wouldn't you just destroy the, the fallen angels kind of thing? Anyway, it, mm. there are a lot of questions, and the ancients were really entertaining this. But one thing that is very important is, is that this group, whoever the Nephilim are, they, they are associated with the Giborim, which, which is a word that you brought up a few minutes ago. 
the, Ooh, uh, the Ezekiel. I, I am. I was going to bring that in because oh, I want to know what you think of that. There seems to be a memory, a later writer. Now, if Ezekiel, what we find in Ezekiel is Ezekiel is clearly the end of the first temple period, right? Mm. So you're talking around 600 BCE, mm. uh, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood. And so I want you to look with me at Ezekiel 37 and and let's just pick up. By the way, if you want to read the whole section for context later, people who want to write this in your notes, Mm. Ezekiel 37, 17 through 32. But I want to focus on uh, verse 27, man. Here we go. Okay, go for it. Um, Hold on. I I pulled up the wrong is it's 32, right? Ezekiel, I think I pulled up the wrong chapter. I think it's 32, 27. Yeah, I had, I told you wrong. 32, 27. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nor, Jono, do they lie beside the fallen heroes of the uncircumcised who went down to Sheol with their weapons of war and whose swords were placed under their heads, but the punishment for their wrongdoing rested on their bones though the terror of these heroes was once in the land of the living. Now, this is the NASB, but let me touch on a couple of things. So it says um, they don't lie down uh, and know they lie is literally what it says. At Giborim, the mighty ones, Noflim. Now, this is the rabbinic pointing of the Meserites. But here you've got, let me just tell you what I'm looking at. I see Mm. the word in Hebrews pointed different than what we find the Nephilim in Numbers 13, 33 and Genesis 6, 4. But the consonants are the same. Nun, Pei, Lamed, Yud, Mim, Nephilim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To find Nephilim and Giborim together, remember in Genesis 6, 4, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they had children, and these were called, whether it's the Nephilim or the children, are called the Gibberim, the mm. men of the name. In Hebrew, it's the uh, men of the name. Uh, but, but here's what I want to propose. I think this, at least as far as the writer of Ezekiel, is giving us a vote for one or the other, meaning... Ezekiel is saying that the Gibberim are, in fact, the Nephilim, that this group is, they are the mighty ones, all right? Not so much the descendants. Now, here, you see where I'm getting at? Because those two words are together. Hmm. So the mighty ones, now, here's the other thing that I find interesting, is that this particular group, they find we find them in Sheol, and it's talking about how they once were in the land of the living. The writer of Ezekiel is, is talking about an ancient men, group of mighty men who were well-known as soldiers. And guess where you'll find them now? They're dead in the grave with their sword on their chest. Mm. But this image of the mighty warriors is still here. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, so I want to ask you, Mm-hmm. We we went through some of the Jerry Springer stuff. It, it's all right. every all of these ancient folks. What did they think? None of these ancient groups or writings put forward a theory that the sons of God were the sons of Seth or right. yeah. the godly branch. They mm-hmm. they if you brought that up to someone in the ancient world, let's say you walked it to Qumran your first century BCE and somebody sitting there writing on a scroll mm. and you go, Oh, I like that story. That story. You're writing a story about the, the sons of God and the daughters of men. Yep. That's what I'm writing. Yeah. Mm. Those, those guys from the deceit of Seth, they shouldn't have messed with those dirty <laughs> girls from across the track. Cain's <laughs> kids. He'd say, what are you talking about? Yeah. The, the ancient world has these myths Mm. And and they're prevalent not only in the Hebrew Bible, they're also we see them in the Greek literature as well. Mm. And 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 so it if you think about 
many of the myths in the Greek world, you, you get the same thing. Oh, yeah, By the absolutely. way, let me one one other point on language. In uh, Ezekiel 32, where it uses the word Nephilim in Hebrew, mm -hmm. remember the Greek Septuagint translates Genesis 6, 4 using the word for giant. But here, yeah. same Hebrew word, they translate with peptokitos. Peptokitos in Greek means fallen ones. Huh. So it's like it's not That's consistent right. in the uh, Septuagint. That's and and this yeah. is an interesting thing. Yeah. Isn't it now, let me ask you a question. I, I have a question. So, right. and I, I'm just interested in your opinion. Maybe you don't have an opinion. I'm sure you do. Do you think, or let me ask it this way when do you think this passage in Genesis, because it seems to me like it is sort of placed within the narrative at a later time, do you think, do you think it is this part about the Nephilim? Into, yeah, the, into the narrative of Noah? Yeah, it seems to be, and, and this is, I know we have people in different places who listen to us, uh, different views, different belief systems, uh, but anyone who reads Genesis chapter 6, it is a story that is unlike anything else. It doesn't feel uh, like the rest of Genesis. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, we don't have stories in the Hebrew Bible hmm. about uh, gods or demigods uh, breeding well, with humans. I mean, look, this is it is something in the ancient world. Uh, Greeks got into this. I mean, Greeks hmm. really believed in this oh, kind of yeah. stuff. He, and, Hebrews, you know, I mean, Hebrews, they have their views that are uh, a little bit out there. But this isn't one of them. You see, and so I think that it it is something which was picked up later, uh, you know, by the Hebrews, and it is an ancient story. Now, one of the things that I I will tell you about this very question is this, um, and, and this, by the way, this is an old copy. This is the Anchor Bible. Anchor Bible oh, wow. uh, is an academic work. And this is on Genesis. So, so mm -hmm. where did the Jews get a story about angels impregnating humans? Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's in the it's in it's in the air, as we say, almost. Mm -hmm. uh, here we go. So, listen to this. Um, the whole perspective. Now, the writer here, um, Spicer, is talking about the ancient world views of this very subject. And it says the whole perspective was recently changed with the discovery of Hittite text, Jono, containing translations of Hurrian myths. Now, a lot of people want to say, well, the Hebrews older or the Greeks older. No, 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 no. Let's go back. Let's go mm. back to some some really I'm talking about uh, the Hurrian myths. These myths parallel the. Ura needs cycle in stru such striking detail as to preclude any possibility of coincidence. So bear with me. The sky god, Anu, is fought and emasculated by his son, Kumarbi, who in turn is vanquished by the storm god, Teshub. But before his victory is assured, Teshub must face a formidable stone master, Ulikumi. The decisive battle takes place near Mount Kazi. By the way, there's going to be a test after this. I hope people are taking notes. Uh, the classical Mount Cassius, which is also the scene of Typhon's battle. Now, the Hurrian original, I guess this is my point, goes back to the middle of the second millennium BC. It is to be the source of Phoenician Greek versions as well as the Hittite adaptation. Now, the reason I bring this up is because these stories are very much related to what we read. Uh, and I don't want to read the whole thing, but about the children being born and the Nephilim coming down. It seems that these go back to Hurrian myths. Mm. So there are a lot of interesting correlations. The further back you go and, you know, uh, both Myth Vision and Gnostic Informant, both those guys are, Neil and Derek are both on 
and they have a lot of the academics that entertain these ancient myths. So where does the story in Genesis 6 come from? We, when we look at the story of Noah, and you talk about comparative religious studies, you, you have to face this. The story is repeated in other languages around the world. So we have Utnat Pishtim. Uh, mm. We have these, these other, the Epic of Gilgamesh and, mm. and some of these stories from other ancient cultures. Now, I do like and I do prefer the story as told by the Hebrews because it's not as crazy, with the exception of Genesis 6 that we're talking about tonight. It's not as crazy in some of these other epic stories. God, the gods are very, uh, they get mad because the, the earthlings are making too much noise. You know, it's like, it's really just kind of bizarre stuff. Mm. So, but I think Genesis 6 is a, it's an idea that's floating around in the ancient world. Do, and, and I guess you might be asking me, do I believe that the story, are you asking me if I think it really happened that uh, angels or fallen angels got women pregnant and produced? Because what I would say is whether I believe it or not, the ancient world, the writers of this text really did believe it. Mm, I think did. that's the way I would put it. They really did. Um, I have now, Myth Vision says, only Nephilim steal people's tea while in the desert. I, I don't know where that comes from. I, I tell I really you where did. it came from. I tell what? you, it happened to me once. But, and, and, and I'm not going to go into all the details right now, but Derek was there. I knew and, there was a story behind this. I, I was, have you ever been so, you've been in the, like you're at the desert. You, it's very, very hot. You're walking in sand and you're just thirsty. Like, yeah. but you, you're not so worried about it because you had a drink up under a bench to keep it in the shade and you go That's to it. get it and you find a person, you see them pour it out into the sand. Could you imagine that happening to you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just say this, that Derek did that to me. <laughs> his wife his wife was there to see it neil might have even seen it but that's probably but, because you're you, what you call tea is some sort of sweet cold drink that you have it's not it's not yeah. like my my nice hot cup of tea here which which i am very um protective of and if if my cup of tea did go missing then that's absolutely and the nephilim did it absolutely deserving of a flood to come and take them out now um i just wanted to say that uh, something that I found out, Ross, that I didn't All know right. before, and I don't know much about it, but apparently the Anakites, who are associated with the Nephilim, and this is I just picked this up on the wiki, are mentioned in the Egyptian execration texts. They are. Uh, of, the, of the Middle Kingdom. Okay, so approximately 2040 uh, 2, to 1782 BCE. Um, as enemies uh, of... Uh, it, uh, Egypt's political enemies in Canaan, it says. And I'm like, well, okay, so this is interesting. The reason why I find it interesting, uh, Ross, is because, and it would be, uh, we, we have to mention this, of course. Uh, there's That's no right. way that we can uh, complete this topic without mentioning the fact that the, because we've already met, we've already read from Deuteronomy chapter 2, and, uh, and I would argue that, and I think you would agree with me, that Deuteronomy chapter 2 is largely taken from the Moses scroll, uh, and um, and a vast majority of, of Deuteronomy, in fact, as a whole, uh, we do not find any mention of the Anakim in the Moses Scroll. We yeah. don't find any mention of giants in the Moses Scroll. There's no reference to the uh, uh, Nephilim or anything like that in the Moses Scroll. It's absolutely devoid of of this topic entirely, Ross. Yeah, I, you know, it's I, I know that. At one point in my, my life, my walk, my religious uh, journey, I was very fundamentalist. And if you ask me uh, way back, do, do I think these, these things are very literal, they're, they're to be understood literally, uh, I would have said yes. I would have said yes, and I would have said that with conviction. Uh, but I no longer uh, hold the view uh, that these ancient myths were even meant to be understood in that sense. 
Mm. Uh, I do think that we don't give enough credit for ancient storytelling. And when we find these ancient stories in other texts and other uh, cultures and other languages, I think we ought to be really deep diving into these and say, just mm. like uh, this was a little bit, I, as I got into it, I, I realized it's a little bit deep if you're not looking at it and studying it. But 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 these ancient texts are very, very interesting because they shed light on the ancient writers and where they were coming from. I'll tell you what, uh, Derek is sending in these super chats, which I appreciate. <laughs> But you you could just keep sending them because that tea cost a lot of money, Derek. I'm just joking. As an L drinks hot tea. That's right. So the but think about unsweet. If, if we if we look at if we look at this subject, I want to do more of these stories, Jono. I want us to take some of these topics and really hmm. jump into them because the Dead Sea Scrolls they give us. Think about this. Up until 1946, 47, we, we didn't have these. And all we had was, you know, the Masoretic text, the oldest copy of which was roughly a thousand of the common era. We have the Septuagint, roughly third century. Uh, but, you know, but when you really get down to it, these ancient texts take us even further back. So to back to your question about the Moses scroll. Mm -hmm. Here we've got a text that doesn't have any of these problematic, you know, like you don't have to believe in giants. You don't have to believe that angels fell from heaven. And, you know, it, it it's just not there. Mm. It's just not there. Now, mm. but if you look at the Anakim, there are stories in the Hebrew Bible. I encourage people to do a search at, uh, at some of these texts on the Anakim. Mm. Joshua cuts them off and then, uh, in chapter 11 and then uh, verse 22, it says that there's still some in Gaza. And uh, now let me add this. When it comes down to it, uh, I'm not so sure that sometimes when we meet these people, like there's a person in the post office that really is, you know, I wonder if this person isn't a descendant of the, you know, it's, I'm not going to say they have reptilian eyes, but there's something that's not, <laughs> no, no, no. There's something not quite right. And you ever meet, you ever meet somebody like this and you're like, you know, if there ever was a story, oh, I could see how some of this starts. Yeah. But what, but what yeah, we've yeah, done. You know, yeah. That, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said for confirmation bias. And I know that a lot of people share on, and <laughs> Facebook is a great place for this to share, uh, uh, you know, photos of, of giants. Or I saw one the other day that um, had uh, drawings of the different sizes of skeletons that have been found over the years, including Oggs, by the way. Apparently we have his skeleton. He was in there. Yeah. Um, and drawn as skeletons. As if this is a fact, you know, this is actually an outline of their skeleton, all this sort of stuff. There's this stuff going around and people just believe it because they want to believe because it says so in the Bible, therefore there must have been giants. And so anything that it concurs with that, uh, belief is just uh, gr grand and, and it's perpetuated. But in actual fact, we have we have no such evidence, no such evidence, no um, uh, skeletons, and uh, much less their their stuff. You know, as as I mentioned um, in the conference uh, when I gave a presentation there, wouldn't their stuff just be bigger? I mean, we find all of this pottery and everything. Wouldn't their stuff be bigger? Let alone well, their let's. Stuff? But hang on, hang yeah. on, Jono. Go hold ahead. your cup, hold your cup up. You know, you're like a giant. I'm a normal size. See, I mean, so you're right. Yeah, that thing's huge. That's like it's almost like one of those old whiskey jugs that people you see. Look, I, I, I tell you though, whenever whenever you look at this, I posted an article uh, on my Facebook about some of these debunked photos mm. of pieces and parts of giants. And mm. some of these discoveries, people thought, hey, this is real. These things are really, look, here's some giant bones. And they turned out to be like the, you know, the the ankle bone of a woolly mammoth. And they're trying to pass yeah, it off. Exactly. You know. yeah. so, but, but, but they, yeah. look, I get it. I get it. You you mm. want to, but, but it really becomes sort of a embellishment of stories. Like if you... If you look at, and I used this example one time when I taught a class, I remember 
I was driving one of my sons to a baseball game. And in the back seat, two little boys were already, they had already lost the game. And we hadn't even arrived at the field yet. And here's why. One of the kids tells my son or my son tells the other kid that this, uh, the Blue Jays are giants or whatever. Mm. And the other kid's like, how big are they? They're like, he's bigger than my dad, which to a midget child, it was a big thing. You know, if these kids have whiskers. Uh, you know, they, they go to the dugout and they drink whiskey. They're smoking. They're, you know, you start, you know, the family, hair their, their hair. Yeah. And they had already almost lost the game before they arrived. Yeah. But, but it's the story that we read in Numbers chapter 13. In Numbers chapter 13, the Israelites are made to say, mm. not only are these giants, but we were grasshoppers yeah, in grass. their eyes. Mm. And, and see, we have a tendency, uh, and the ancients are no different, there, mm. there is this embellishment where you, you say the walls are all fortified. Every wall is fortified. Every person there is a giant. And, and uh, that's, we also get another story in the Hebrew Bible that people ignore. Mm. And that's something like a Joshua's report where he says, no, nope, mm. not true. We can take this land, you know. So mm. I, I, it's not that I'm opposing the biblical text. I'm, I'm simply highlighting that that's what we see in some of these ancient texts. Coming back to fortified walls, there is the fact that there is <laughs> enormous stones that are moved into place. We're going to see some of those when we are on tour. And uh, we're just going to explain it away by saying Nephilim's did that. But <laughs> That's right. That's right. Could but, be. Um, but in actual fact, we have absolutely no idea. We're going to see some of that uh, in Egypt. We're going to see some of that in uh, Jordan and most certainly at the Kotel in uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. This coming Tanakh Tour, TanakhTours.com. Is there still time for people to uh, join the tour, Ross? Uh, you know, let me put the link up because we would have to call. I'm, I'm telling you, it really is. Uh, it really is close now. They're, they're making final room arrangements, so tanaktours.com, tanaktours.com. But look, I mean, we're going. We are literally flying at the end of October, and we're going to meet in Cairo. Dave Tyler is on here. Karen is here. Jeffrey might be here. Uh, several people who are going to be on the tour are going to be in Egypt. We're going to do Egypt. We're going to take two flights. We're going to take a three-night Nile cruise. We're going to go to the traditional Mount Sinai, which isn't really the real Sinai, but we'll tell you all about it when we're there. That's we're right. going to hike Sinai. Uh, we're going to probably, our goal is to cross the Gulf of Aqaba into to Jordan. Aqaba, go to the Wadi Rum, go up yep. to uh, to Petra. Petra, uh, that's right. Oh, my word. Uh, uh, incredible. Uh, and, and, of course, the Wadi Mujib. Let's, uh, and we're going to be talking about this. And I'm right. um, showing you some very interesting caves. Uh, we're going to be going to uh, Mount Nebo, obviously, before uh, they scouted out the land and decided that. Oh, and we're going to uh, uh, we're going all all through Israel. Now, listen, the the first leg of the tour, Egypt, Jordan, you can do that one. Or if you yep. want, you can do the second leg of the tour, which is Israel. Uh, you can do that one by itself as well from the 12th of November. You can do both of them, and you'll save a hundred dollars in doing both. Um, but I tell you what, dear, dear viewers, if you want to come in, we do want you to come with us. You're going to have to get your deposit in and secure your seat before October because we are locking things down uh, and we would love to see you there. So get a deposit down before uh, October hits and we will be seeing you in the Holy Land uh, discussing some of these things. That's right. That'd be great. Support this stream. There is the QR code. Click on that because you're going to get a whole lot of uh, extra goodies. Tell us quickly about that, Ross. Yeah, <clears throat> for those who support the stream, we're doing quite a bit. Uh, what we do, first of all, is you'll see on the, the page when you go there, uh, the way that we set that up, we, we provide everything that we do at no charge. However, those who help support what we're doing here, the creation of these videos and the research that goes into them, we do, we do have some perks. One of the things that we do is every Wednesday night, we do an exclusive Zoom call we get in, we're doing all sorts of stuff. And right now, as an added bonus for that group, we're also teaching biblical Hebrew. So we're doing Hebrew classes on okay. Wednesday nights, and then we're doing yeah. this other Zoom call. So it's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, are you still going through your series on 
uh, Isaiah each Shabbat. Absolutely. Yep. Isaiah. Right. That's right. Yep. Well, so people yeah, can come to here. Hey, to uh, shout out to Josh Jones, who asked me a question. I think it was on Isaiah chapter 28, and you're going to get this soon enough. Uh, I said to him, stop bothering me. Just wait for Ross to do the program. <laughs> no, I gave him an answer. Yep. But um, but I'm sure you'll have a much more in-depth answer to that particular question. So where are you up to in Isaiah? Uh, this is going to be class number five of Isaiah, of the series on Isaiah. Mm. And uh, I hope that some of the viewers here tonight can join me Saturday morning, every Saturday morning, 1030 a.m. Central Time, right here, youtube.com slash Ross K. Nichols TV. So join us. And look, Jono, I, I know we've got some ideas about what we're going to do next week mm -hmm. at this time on Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central uh, in the U.S. Uh, you'll have to tell your Australian folks what time. But look, this is the kind of fun we're going to have every week. So we hope that people will join us. This is it. Uh, now, listen, we, we did say that we were going to address any questions. The comments have been flying fast. Uh, I don't know that we can go back and read all of this to find. Do we, do we have time to... I really don't yeah, know. We, we could, let's take let's take a couple of minutes. Let's see if uh, if somebody wants to uh, hit us with some burning questions, and uh, we'll definitely take a few minutes to do that. I think that's worth it. Yeah, I don't doubt that people have been burning questions, and we're going. Can't well, go back. here's the other thing. Uh, Seth has this set up on where all of the questions are. They're going to be in the chat. Oh, and, there you uh, go. You know, so so one thing that's good, and and this is one thing that you brought up the other day is, uh, when we come back Wednesday, we'll also have a few questions, and we might even say, look, last week this question came up, so if we didn't cover it, you know, we've given you quite a bit on the ancient worldview of uh, the fallen ones, Nephilim. Mm. By the mm. way, what do you what do you think? You think? Uh, do you agree with me that in the ancient world that uh, that they believed that this was actually uh, fallen from heaven kind of? Oh, yeah, or, absolutely. Okay. No, there's no doubt right. about that. There's I'm no doubt about sure. that. And, and generally in the ancient world, what I've come to realize is that everyone was as short as you, Ross. That's true. That's true. Mm. Yeah, humanity at one point was all perfect it's in the garden. In the garden, in the garden, yeah. we're pretty sure that all humans, yeah, well, it was just Adam and Eve, but they were five foot eight and, uh, you know, about 185. That was it. Yeah. So Dave says, uh, given my trip to Warsaw, Poland, uh, a few weeks ago, at six foot one, I felt like a midget. What are you saying, Dave? Is everyone um, uh, just giants over there in Poland? Okay, look. We've got we've got an invite here. What's this? Uh, Yodi Yahu Hanakman says, "Stop by my shop in the Jewish quarter. I sell handmade talit totes, and my colleague is a Jewish scribe." I I wonder, Jono, is this the shop that we've been to before? If not, we have to find Yodi Yahu uh, Hanakman uh, when we we're there. That. There's, a, there's a little uh, project for us to do. We can do that. Let me tell you this. Uh, Please hit us up and make sure we know the name of your shop because yeah, it. we're gonna we'll bring a whole mob of people in there and uh that's gonna be fun. There you go. All right. Well, it looks like we've covered all bases because everyone seems uh, happy. There's no questions. we go. What's this? It was fun. It's a meeting in ancient people. That's it. Clo, there we go. Um, there you go. Glad you enjoyed it. We're gonna be back this time next week. The topic. Uh, we'll figure it out uh, between Ross and myself, and we'll let you one, know in advance. Hey, Dave. One one thing that's sure is we will announce it and send out a note and let everybody know. So, hey, look, thanks for joining us. And, uh, oh, by the way, there's Christo. We, I, I didn't mean to leave you out. Christo's going on the tour with us again, too. Yeah, so is Tiffany. We, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Tiffany. And, and yeah, yeah. Well. Say good day. Everyone is going on the tour. Quick, give us a quick comment here. Everyone is going on the tour. There's Dave. He's going to be on the tour. Tiffany will be there. Christo will be there. Who yeah. else is? Who else is watching that's going to be on the tour? Come on. It's a roll call. This is a tour yeah. roll call. Yeah, what we got? Now. Let's see. Let's Drum see roll. if they can do it quickly. Is there a delay maybe? Yeah, there is. Maybe maybe some don't want anybody to know they're going with us, Jono. That could be it. Yep, Dave and Patty. Patty. All right, there you go. It's going to be good. Look, 
While this is coming on, let me let me do one thing, Jono. I'm gonna hmm. play some music. Ooh. Uh there's Karen. She'll be there. Yeah, Karen's going. I'm mm -hmm. just gonna see if this music can you hear that? Like that. So outro music. I love that. Okay, look, one more thing before we go. I'm practicing, trying to get fancy here. Look at this. Look at this. What? Nephilim, what? ladies and gentlemen, angels mm -hmm. on earth. Hey, I want you to notice this. Seth yeah. made this. Look at the glass. Look at the detail. Look at our sunglasses, Jonah. <laughs> that is really cool. You see that dark, ominous, fallen angel in our glasses? <laughs> there you go. Look. He does a great job in the control room there, Seth. Well done, mate. All right. All right. This time okay. next week. Everybody share this. Let us uh, join us next week. Have a beautiful week. And look, join me on Saturday morning, 1030 a.m. Central Time. There you go. We'll see you next week. Cheers.